started. Before we get started, here we have provided just an overall table of contents for today's presentation, just to kind of illustrate how we are going to be moving through this. So before we get into the actual case study and results, we're first going to talk a bit about the background information for GGV, some socio-ecological context, and COVID-19 effects. And then from there, we go into our methodology and results, which will then lead us into recommendations and our strategic agenda. And then we have some potential future research, as well as our own personal reflections and experience that this project provided. So starting off quickly after their discovery and recognition as a species, mountain gorilla populations began to decline due to anthropogenic effects such as hunting, war, disease, deforestation, and even the illegal pet trade. Soon after this, Volcanoes National Park was established in 1925, and this became one of Africa's oldest national parks. Now, while Rwanda's economy is predominantly dependent on the agricultural market, this past decade has shown exponential growth surrounding their tourism industry, with thousands of international travelers coming to see the idyllic mountain gorillas. And so while these species have only become more increasingly protected throughout the decades due to collaborations between um, conservationists, locals, governments, and NGOs, the national park still faces a lot of issues with illegal activity that are occurring within the park boundaries. Uh, it was through a social ecological lens by conservationists that kind of discovered this connection between illegal activity and local community livelihoods of those living near park borders. So the national park itself is surrounded by a very dense population with many people working as subsistence farmers and living in extreme poverty with kind of little options for alternative sources of income. Uh, despite the government's enforcement of very strict anti-poaching measures, illegal activity still plays a huge issue today, including hunting for bushmeat, harvesting craft and medicinal materials, and firewood collection. So with the goal of decreasing poaching inside of the national park through livelihood development, in 2007, GGV was created with the idea of aiding livelihood development through conservation and tourism. Since then, Guerrilla Guardians Village has successfully reformed many poachers and improved community livelihoods through their community-based cooperative model. And since its inception, Guerrilla Guardians has grown to include 10 cooperatives and hundreds of members. Over the years, they have continued to reinforce the value of the park and wildlife by enhancing the benefits of ecotourism to local communities through engaging in the ecotourism industry. As you walk into the cultural village within one of the huts, you can see profiles of about a dozen members that all share their experiences and life changes since joining the community. And I think the benefits of the village can be really well highlighted by this one quote here. Uh, today, people in my community see my success and I show them the benefits of conserving our natural resources. So before getting started, we first had to start looking at the effects that were created by the pandemic and how these were specifically impacting the ecotourism sector. What was seen all across the board in countries all around the world was this ripple effect on rural communities and wildlife conservation. So many low income communities depend on ecotourism as a means to not only make a living, but also to protect their natural resources. So in April of 2020, when this was instantly cut off with the international border closures and the social safety measures that were implemented, this led to months of inactivity and many countries that depended on tourism were starting to face severe economic consequences and still are today with high levels of job loss, reduced wages, and increased environmental crime, many of these countries are confronting the economic aftermath that the pandemic has left and will most likely leave for years to come. Okay, sorry about that. I was trying to figure out how to unmute myself. Uh, okay. <laughs> So what are community cooperatives? Uh, just to give a brief overview for people who may not be super familiar with what they are, um, they arise from a concern for community where every member is supported to advance their well-being through voluntary membership to reach a common goal. 
So specifically for GGV, members will pay a one-time entry fee and pool their resources, resources together so that everyone is benefited. They provide things like training and knowledge sharing and members are provided a weekly stipend from a cooperative pool. And for the crafts cooperative, members receive a commission from the crafts sold. The system allows cooperatives to act as a safety net in case members experience, oh, sorry, my chair just, <laughs> my chair just, uh, give me a second, okay, here we go. Okay, so um, the system allows cooperatives to act as a safety net in case a uh, member experiences unfortunate circumstances like a bad crop yield or a loss of livestock. So uh, as Summer mentioned, GGV has 10 total community cooperatives, uh, such as the Cultural Village, um, Craft Enterprises, Beekeeping, Seed Multiplication, and then the rest are different types of agricultural cooperatives like potato or mushroom farming. All right, so our case study was comprised of semi-structured interviews, as well as participatory community surveys with the three cooperatives of the dancers, seed multiplication and crafts. We also conducted a literature review to gain more insight into the effects of COVID-19 on ecotourism, as well as what similar communities to GGV were facing and how they themselves were overcoming the challenges of losing their market. A SWOT analysis was also done based on the interview transcripts to break down the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of the organization. And then all of these mixed data methods were utilized to create an informed strategic agenda to improve organizational resilience, focused on addressing the impacts of COVID-19, as well as exploring some alternatives to ecotourism. Okay, so moving into the methodology of our case study. Um, so we focused on three out of the 10 GGB cooperatives and we chose these three cooperatives based on their ability to represent some of the predominant industries that GGB utilizes. So craft selling, ecotourism and agriculture. So we conducted semi-structured interviews with the leaders of the three cooperatives that we chose and they uh, were facilitated with the help of GGB's manager, David, acting as our translator. And then we recorded these discussions and then later transcribed them. And then we used these interview transcriptions to identify key themes that showed up during these conversations. So this allowed us to make an informed analysis of the three cooperatives and aided in the development of our SWOT analysis. So these are some of the example questions from our interviews. These questions allowed us to gain further insight into what the leaders thought were beneficial. So what was working or not working and what needed to happen for the cooperatives to recuperate from COVID-19. The information that we gathered from these discussions later allowed us to analyze the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, which we will dive uh, into later on. So our second set of data collection was obtained through written surveys and distributed amongst individuals from each of the three cooperatives. This, these surveys primarily served as a way to assess the impacts of COVID on members of GGB. So they were written, initially written in English and then translated into Kenya Rwanda using a method called translation back translation. So we had one translator translate from English to Kenya Rwanda and then a separate translator translate that version back to English. And this allowed us to identify any discrepancies in translation and just helped us increase the reliability of our translations. Um, so included in the survey were questions to assess perceptions of well-being and illegal activity in the park, both before and after the emergence of COVID-19. So, Getting into our uh, survey size and participant selection, we aim to get an equal number of men and women and we separated them into different small groups to discourage gender bias. We had translators presence, present in each small survey group uh, to clarify things when needed. They were also a necessity in order to clarify some questions for participants um, that needed the surveys verbally communicated because they weren't able to read the written questions. We also took a lot of COVID-19 safety precautions, including administering them outside, um, wearing masks and 
sanitizing all of our equipment in between groups. So it's also really important to note that before we left to go to Rwanda, the country had been at a level two travel advisory and they had eased a lot of restrictions. Um, millions of people had been getting vaccinated and COVID numbers had been declining and all of these trends seem to be heading in an overall positive direction. Um, so with the help of our advisors at CSU, we felt really confident making the decision to continue on with our trip. Um, however, with, with all things COVID, we were hit with an unexpected wave of the Delta variant and around our third week in country, um, we started to experience some increasing restrictions. Um, and so this created a really uncertain situation for us where we were being met with a lot of restrictions. Um, and so we set out to administer these surveys while still adhering to all of the restrictions that were being put in place and make sure that we were taking all of the COVID precautions that we possibly could. Um, but this did limit our ability to gather uh, surveys and interviews. And we, we chose participants based on their availability, their proximity to the cultural village uh, so that no one was traveling too far and their, also their willingness to participate without monetary compensation. So we unfortunately did have some misunderstandings where people were expecting to be paid for their time. And when we communicated that we were unable to pay, we unfortunately did have some people who chose not to participate at that point. Um, so for all of those reasons, and with the limitations presented by this unexpected, unexpected wave of COVID, our small survey size should be taken into consideration uh, when interpreting the results of our survey. So the questions that we had on our written surveys, we started with basic demographic questions, including education, income, gender, age, number of children, um, and then we assessed well being. Uh, and so we did this, we used the care security model, which has been developed specifically to measure the impact of community, de community development initiatives, uh, in which it provided basic indicators of well being. So we uh, used these four indicators food, education, income, and healthcare. Um, and this allowed us to identify some critical livelihood constraints in the community. And so this is just an example question of uh, what we asked participants. So you'll see we used a five point Likert scale and we had this visual representation to minimize any miscommunication or confusion. And we stated a first question of how satisfied were you with, so we asked for overall quality of life. Um, and then we also asked for each of the four indicators. So food, education, income, and healthcare. Um, and so we asked for their perceptions before COVID and then today at the time the survey was taken. So we also asked participants about their perceptions of illegal activity in the community. And this allowed us, the reason that we chose to ask about perceptions is because it allowed us to ask about a sensitive topic in a more discreet and indirect way. Uh, that wouldn't require participants to reveal any potentially incriminating information or make them uncomfortable or just put them in a situation where they feel more likely to lie or give false information. Um, and so it allowed us to gauge individual perceptions of illegal activity um, and could be really helpful in determining if people felt that COVID caused uh, illegal activity to increase. So here are some example questions that we asked people. Um, so we asked for each of the, the four indicators. So how much does food security influence illegal forest use in Volcanoes National Park? And we used a five point Likert scale. Um, yeah. So also just to note all of these, uh, our survey and the interview portions of the study largely informed the recommendations and strategic agenda for GGP. So moving into our results and analysis. So just looking at our survey participants overall, we had a pretty even split between men and women. Uh, we also had a fairly even split between each of the three cooperatives that we chose to focus on. We did have a few less from seed multiplication. Um, I believe that a lot of them were a little bit farther away from the cultural village. Uh, and so we did end up having a few less from that cooperative. And then our age breakdown, um, we had 
a majority of our participants fall into these two age categories from 19 uh, to 40 years old. And then for education, a majority of people had up to a primary level of education with a smaller number who had secondary vocational or no education. So for, we asked participants uh, two separate questions. The first one here, we asked them, do you have enough food availability to meet the needs of your family, yes or no? And we broke this down by cooperative because we wanted to see the differences between the three cooperatives. Um, and so what this shows us is that 100% of people from seed multiplication said no, they did not have enough access to food. Um, while a smaller percentage from crafts in the cultural village said yes, they did have access to food. And then a uh, second question that we asked people, uh, do you have access to healthcare, yes or no? Um, and so what we can see here is that a majority of the crafts and the dancers of the cultural village responded yes, they had access to healthcare, while the majority of people from the seed multiplication said no, they did not have access to healthcare. Okay, so diving into our well being questions. So these were, uh, this is a lot of data on this chart, but just to break this down, so we asked people about their satisfaction with well being before COVID 19 and then at the time the survey was taken. Um, and we asked for each of these well being indicators. Um, and then overall. And so we can see very similar trends playing out here. Um, and just to point out, we also, so we asked the five point Likert scale, we just categorized into three uh, different categories. So satisfied, neutral, or not satisfied, uh, just for ease of translation here. Um, and so if we're just looking at these uh, one variable at a time, so we can see that the majority of people responded that they were satisfied with their quality of life before COVID, but then a majority were not satisfied at the time the survey was taken. And we can see this same trend uh, play out across each of these different variables. And so another question that we asked was, what has had the biggest impact on your well being? And we asked people to rate these well-being indicators from one to four with one being the most important. And so what this graph shows us is that most people rated income as number one for being most important. Uh, and most people rated food as number two, health as number three, and education as number four. And this is a trend that we saw when we also asked the same question about illegal activity in Volcanoes National Park. Uh, we saw a very similar trend where uh, income was first and then um, food was second, health, and then education. So then we asked people, what is your overall assessment of legal activity in Volcanoes National Park before COVID and today? And this was actually a bit of a surprising uh, trend that we saw where the low perceptions of legal activity, there were lower perceptions of illegal activity at the time the survey was taken. Um, so yeah, that was, that was an interesting trend that we saw. Um, and then we asked people, so how much does uh, blank security influence illegal forest use in Volcanoes National Park? Uh, and so uh, we can see here that there were overall pretty low perceptions that each well being variable had on illegal activity. Um, one thing to note, though, is that health had slightly higher percentage of high perceptions. Um, one thing I, I could speculate that access to healthcare could reduce harvesting of medicinal herbs. Maybe people know more people who are in the community um, going into the park in collecting medicinal herbs or things like that. Okay, so what do you believe would most significantly decrease illegal activity in the park? This was our last question on the survey. And 
uh, in hindsight, we maybe would have asked this question a little bit differently because we asked people to rate, we gave them a number of possible responses and asked them to rate them like one through five, but then we gave more than five possible answers. Um, so yeah, in hindsight, we might have phrased this a little bit differently, uh, but we did get some clear trends here where this is just the percentage of people who chose each of these responses. And so these uh, responses, owning land, owning cattle, the cultural village, selling produce uh, that are marked with the red bar charts, those were most commonly chosen by people as having the most significance. And so if we're just looking at uh, the top, the most chosen responses, um, and then looking at how people ranked them from one to five, um, we see that owning land was more frequently rated um, as having higher importance and then owning cattle. Um, so yeah, that's some interesting responses. All right, I'm gonna give it back to Summer. Okay, so we utilize the SWAT method to determine the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for GGV. And these were all determined through the literature review, the semi-structured interviews, and just kind of an overall situation assessment. Through those interviews, we transcribed and then coded for themes to create an informed code book. And this aided in providing guidance for the strategic agenda and the recommendations as well. So starting off with strengths, a big component for why GGV has been so successful in its mission is the informed bottom-up approach that focuses on what the community needs. So all of the cooperatives are led and ran by community members. And due to this, all of the decisions being made are informed by what members need and or want. So even though it is a membership community, the organization also has vital relationships with government and NGO stakeholders that provide community support and assistance. So for example, throughout the pandemic, the relationships that GGV had with both the Rwandan Development Board and the Institute of Guerrilla Conservation Project provided vital aid to the community. RDB provided them with food, livestock, and even revenue sharing throughout COVID-19. Uh, Pre-pandemic, GGV membership also proved to provide a higher quality of life to members. Um, as was recognized in the cohort seven case study. Uh, so even before the pandemic hit, GGV was still meeting their mission goals of providing those higher qualities of life for people. And then lastly for strengths, the governance structure of the cooperatives allows for representation and leadership among members. And this kind of gives a centralized focus on member input as well as providing people with potential leadership opportunities. Next up is weaknesses. Now, COVID-19 made it very apparent for a lot of community-based tourism organizations of the benefits that could have came from having an informed disaster relief plan in effect. Similar to these organizations, GGV was also not prepared in this sense, and while there's no way to predict every possible scenario that could happen, having a general plan of action to implement in the event of future crises might have been able to better prepare GGV to respond more adequately to community needs. And although communication within individual cooperatives is a strength, um, a greater emphasis should be placed on creating stronger communication between cooperatives. And there is also this lack of funding and resources available to recruit new members and not enough outlets to support members in joining multiple cooperatives. This multi-cooperative membership could aid in diversifying individual livelihoods who could benefit from having those multiple income streams as well as skills. Next is maintenance costs. This was also pointed out in the cohort seven case study and was one of their recommendations as well. The hut maintenance cost and upkeep is expensive between painting, rethatching, and everything else that the huts need to be maintained and the villagers need to determine if the cost of their upkeep is worth the amount of money they do bring in. And lastly is the website. With the world continuously moving forward in a technological centered realm, it is becoming more and more relied on. Uh, specifically, GGV's central website is difficult to navigate and overall the organization does lack a significant media presence. It's very crucial to the growth of GGV's success to have a 
credible web pre presence and to improve their website as this could great, greatly benefit their donation market as well as enhance their visibility to larger audiences. But while there are points of weakness in the organization, there is substantial opportunity for growth. The main two that we saw were increasing diversification of livelihoods with multiple cooperative memberships and a shift to domestic tourism focus. The pandemic has shown that depending on an unpredictable market like tourism can lead to abrupt income cutoffs. Partaking in other forms of income generating activities can provide a safety net for those who are making a majority of their money through tourism. Related to this is the dependence on an international market. With the sudden closure of borders, many organizations were left with zero market because a lot of their focus went into international tourists compared to domestic. Um, diversifying these pro products and services to appeal to a more domestic market can open up a subsector of customers that are not affected by outside events like international border closures. And GGV's website also has a lot of opportunity to become more user friendly with easier accessibility and overall appearing more attractive to consumers. This would enhance their marketability, increase exposure to more potential tourists. And then also is the closure of the cultural village as another opportunity that should be explored more in depth as well as closing the village could potentially lead to more funding to be used in support of other cooperative needs. And then lastly, threats. If COVID-19 did anything for many communities, it was to reveal weak spots that serve as future potential threats. So a big one being the effects that future natural disasters can have, especially if they do result in those border closures. The cascading effect of the loss of tourism to the loss of livelihood security and income also made apparent the cost of becoming solely dependent on a single skill set. Diversifying livelihood could create more resiliency in this scenario. And then finally, keeping the cultural village open could potentially turn into a monetary burden that swallows up much needed resources. Okay, so moving into ecotourism, uh, this is an important industry that GGB has tapped into in this region, and it's a predominant source of income for a lot of people, and it's something that we looked at pretty heavily in our literature review to inform recommendations and assess ways to improve GGB's ability to utilize this market. So there are a lot of strengths and weaknesses to this industry. It has the potential to lead to more social and economic growth in rural and impoverished areas. It can also strengthen natural and cultural heritage and enhance education, but it also has the capability of threatening local areas if it's not done responsibly. It can threaten local tradition, exacerbate climate change, uh, perpetuate natural resource exploitation or increase pollution. So some specific strengths of Rwandan ecotourism is their current political stability, um, their historical heritage and their rich local culture. However, the downside is that tourism is seasonal and it's subject to various global circumstances, which means that tourism is not a reliable or consistent source of income as we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, some other weaknesses to this industry are the lack of academic research related to tourism and low environmental education in tourist communities, especially in regards to conservation and ecotourism it's essential that tourism practices are not perpetuating harm to the environment that they're intending to protect. So there's a need for some more specific research into ecotourism in order to assess specific strengths and weaknesses and establish better practices. So some solutions that are being implemented to strengthen ecotourism organizations, just in general and in response to COVID-19, um, are creating sustainable and socially conscious tourism developed with local communities, increasing public and private collaboration, uh, creating ecotourism models that don't depend on a large number of park visitors, increasing domestic tourism, increasing diversification of livelihoods, um, and increasing the use of technology, which could mean uh, through social media usage or online marketing, amongst other things. Um, Okay, so moving into our strategic agenda, um, it was really important for us to have 
specific actionable things that GGB could take moving forward as a result of our case study. And we really wanted to help them move forward from the impacts of the pandemic. So we created this agenda to guide their future focus. And we wrote a detailed actionable list of items that could help them focus in on some specific strategies to improve their organization. So I'm not gonna go fully into all of these for the purpose of our presentation. I'm just gonna focus on uh, two of uh, the more important overarching strategies that could be implemented in the immediate future. Uh, but just to give a brief overview of the full scope of our strategic agenda. Um, so starting off, one of our key areas that we identified was uh, marketing and organizational presence. Uh, so we'll go into that one a little more detail on the next slide. And then we had increasing benefits of the cultural village. So looking at ways to expand and increase revenue brought in through the village, for example, um, offering more tourist uh, experiential classes like teaching traditional beekeeping. Uh, those would be really cool opportunities to look into. So our next one was improving cooperative operational strategies. So we provided some specific step-by-step -step actions for cooperatives based on the discussions that we had with leaders and cooperative members. And some are talked about a lot of these things in the SWOT analysis. So we identified some gaps in communication and knowledge sharing and decision-making between cooperatives. And so improving these things would greatly help increase the success of these individual cooperatives. Um, and so one example that we had provided um, for possible strategies was uh, woofing. So if people don't know what that is, it's where people will uh, basically work um, in agriculture. So working on farms in exchange for accommodations. And so a lot of uh, young people also are looking for these types of experiences. Um, and so this could be a great way for GGB to uh, bring in more people to the cultural village. Um, and increased knowledge sharing between communities and people through this program, and it could be mutually beneficial. So another overarching strategy that we had was conservation-centric strategies. Uh, so to improve their goal of decreasing illegal activity um, and increasing education. Um, but So these strategies would have to come after um, some of the more immediate goals of recovering from COVID and um, firstly just focusing on helping improving community well-being. Um, but some of, the, some of the examples that we had here were um, teaching workshops on leave no trace principles to some of the guerrilla porters um, or creating birding groups or things like that. And then enhancing organizational resilience, which we'll go into on the next slide. Okay, so uh, we had some, these are our top three strategies that we identified. So creating a disaster plan in the event of future crises. Um, and so this could encompass um, more than these three things, but here, uh, these, these top three points that we wanted to go over was just creating an emergency financial aid fund, um, emphasizing diversification of livelihoods. So in the event, the loss of ecotourism, people aren't left reeling uh, from these types of things and then uh, creating community support programs. Um, and so it'd be, it's important to note that when COVID did initially hit, there were a lot of people who uh, were implementing these types of things and helping their neighbors. And so these things definitely existed, um, but perhaps creating a more streamlined and step-by-step -step plan in the event of emergency could eliminate some confusion or um, help GGB respond quicker. And then our next one was prioritize generating income outside of ecotourism. Um, so we've gone over this already, but um, this could be accomplished by expanding into uh, or expanding the agricultural cooperatives and just looking at uh, how to expand livelihoods from these cooperatives. Okay, and then our third one was focus efforts locally. So uh, focusing on local domestic tourism and expanding into local markets. Okay, so um, marketing and organizational presence. So uh, again, these are just top three, but not our fully comprehensive list. Um, 
So we had improving the website, web presence, and some are talked about this uh, through the SWOT analysis as well, but just improving the ease of navigating the website, um, directing people more easily to bookings at the cultural village. So have, having like an online booking calendar um, and having a donation page um, and maybe updating donors more frequently through the website. Uh, this could be through blog posts or newsletters. Um, and then registering as a 501c3 in the US which could expand international reach and bring in more donors. And then expanding the reach of GGB through media and increased fundraising efforts, so seeking out more reporting opportunities um, and uh, streamlining methods to bring in donors. And so this, this kind of comes back to the, having like an easy to navigate donation page on the website. Um, and I did want to provide one example that we had. Um, so while we were at GGB, there were some tourists who were still coming in, even though it had greatly decreased because of COVID. Um, people were still traveling. And um, there was a woman who came in who was very interested in donating to the GGB water tap. Um, and so there wasn't a very direct way to um, instruct her on how to donate through the website. Uh, and so the manager was having conversations with her and um, she was promising to follow up. But if there was a more streamlined method that might um, just help with the overall ease of um, donating and communicating to people about that. All right, so moving into conclusions. All right. So starting this case study, our primary questions were, has GGV been able to meet people's basic needs and have they continued to succeed in their mission of decreasing illegal activity in the park. Utilizing four different measures of livelihood, education, health, food, and income, it was determined that the community was not able to continue to adequately support the livelihoods through the COVID-19 pandemic, with a majority of survey participants indicating that their well-being had significantly declined. Poverty levels remained high and a majority of people answer that they did not have sufficient access to food. 25% of people in the seed multiplication cooperative and 11% from the craft cooperative supplemented their income with extraneous labor jobs. The overall well-being of GGB members was severely impacted by the pandemic, but respondents showed that most people were satisfied with their well-being pre-COVID, which does indicate that up until the pandemic point, GGV was successful in meeting their goals. Income was consistently ranked as having the biggest impact on individuals' well being and illegal activity, while education was consistently ranked last. And this doesn't necessarily mean that education is undervalued in the community. It could just indicate that other variables were more essential. This does also highlight, though, that education can fall behind when people's basic needs are not being met. So moving forward, GGV should prioritize educational efforts once they are able to resume full operations and further research into education and its impacts could also be useful. What was interesting was that perceptions of illegal activity during the pandemic were low and did not show any positive trends with an overall assessment actually showing a slight decrease in perceived illegal activity. This could potentially indicate that GGV was still able to succeed in preventing members from turning to illegal activity despite the drastic impact on their well being. Results also indicated that the Cultural Village Cooperative, cooperative had better access to food, health care, education, and income. Despite them losing the ecotourism market, it seemed that the village was still able to provide better access to these resources than other cooperatives. And it should also be noted that gender was not fully evaluated on its role in these four indicators due to the small sample size. And it is recommended that GGV evaluate and take action to address any disproportionate social and economic pressures that women could potentially be facing. And the final question of the survey highlighted several key types of livelihoods that would benefit GGV to focus on. Owning land was one of the most top ranked answers indicating that individuals in possession of their own land would seem to have the greatest impact on their livelihoods and well being. Overall, the survey showed that GGV's influence on poaching seems to remain stable due to how low the community perceptions of illegal activity were. 
and that the village's influence likely helped in this, even though people were experiencing such widespread financial strain. But again, there should be more research done on this. Going forward, as was pointed out in the strategic agenda and SWOT analysis, Guerrilla Guardians should focus on COVID-19 recovery methods in the near future with a focus on development that falls outside of the realm of ecotourism. Uh, this should also contribute to a diversification of members' livelihoods through alternative income streams. And it's our hope that this case study could also be applied to other similar community-based cooperatives around the world that are facing similar issues as GGV and could serve as general guidance for them as well. We tried to tailor our strategic agenda recommendations to be specific enough for Guerrilla Guardians to follow and implement, but also general enough to where other cooperatives could also utilize and implement as well. And because of this, we are hoping to publish our final deliverables to make the information accessible for any other organizations that could potentially find it beneficial. And finally, before we get into reflections, we have potential future research. Um, there are still several knowledge gaps that can benefit from re future research on this topic. One being, despite the insecurities surrounding food and income, people's perceptions of illegal activity was still perceived as low. Um, do these reflect perceptions actually reflect reality? And is this due to people near the park still being motivated to protect wildlife, even when their livelihoods are so negatively impacted by COVID? Or are there some other forms of justification for why individuals did not perceive illegal activity rates as high? The four well-being factors presented in the survey were all viewed as having low impact on illegal resource extraction. So what other motivating factors could be alternatives for why individuals might be going into the National Park for Resources. And while the focus of this study did center on people specifically in the village that surround the park, a key missing component is input from enforcement officers. Future surveys and interviews should be done with RDB officers to get their insights on illegal activity and what they think are factors in motivating people to utilize resources from within the park's boundaries. And along with this, it would also be of interest to note whether economic trends of annual individuals income surrounding the park correlates at all with rates of illegal activity in the park throughout the years. And then finally, reflections. So throughout our stay in Rwanda, the time spent working on this project, there were quite a lot of things for us to look back on and reflect. But for the sake of this presentation, we narrowed it down to these main five. And first off was the importance of using mixed method approach to gathering information. We utilize surveys, interviews, and even informal discussion as a means to compile all the information that we did. In each one, we were met with different responses, attitudes, and relevant information that we wouldn't have gotten if we would have just stuck to one mean means of information gathering. Um, for the sharing results and final deliverables with the village, as we are working on our recommendations, a lot of things we were discovering were also things that cohort seven had recommended as well, leading us to assume a lack in communication or goal monitoring, monitoring of what GGV was able to implement on the ground from what previous capstone projects had discovered. And next, which is arguably one of the most important points of reflection for us, was navigating an African country as a very obvious white Western researcher. Throughout our program, we have learned a lot about colonialism's role historically and even presently in conservation. Because of this, Lauren and I wanted to ensure that going to Rwanda, we were taking all the precautions to ensure an ethically conscious approach. So in December of this last year, we went, met with No White Saviors which is a women's led organization out of Uganda that focuses on advocacy and education on the African experience and disrupting the white savior complex that so heavily, that so heavily influences international development and aid. Uh, this consultation allowed us to talk firsthand with experienced educators on how to best navigate ourselves as white Western people and important personal reflections for us to think about. Uh, they also took the time to share great res resources for us to read through before moving forward. 
And a majority of our prep work not only centered around GGV as an organization in a social ecological context of Rwanda, but also reading up on white colonialism in African countries and how we could do our own part as researchers. Um, and if you don't already, I highly recommend following the No White Saviors account on Instagram for some great information and some good call to action steps. Um, next one is I'm sure something we probably all had difficulties with for some level, and that was navigating the pandemic. Um, before departing for Rwanda, the country was under stage two. So while masks were still required and there were large gathering preventions, people were still able to move pretty freely between districts in country. But like Lauren was saying, two weeks after we arrived, they entered a stage three and each week safety measures just got more and more strict to where when we finally left, they were in a stage four of stay at home orders. Uh, this obviously was an unforeseen thing on our end and suddenly we were rushing around trying to figure out a remote projects that we could work on if we suddenly had to leave and catch a flight back to the States or B, see how quickly we could put together surveys and distribute them before stay at home orders were enacted. We got extremely lucky in that the day we finished our surveys, we got an update from the Rwandan government that in like 48 hours stay at home orders were to be mandated in we barely finished up in the village with the data that we could gather. And this was unfortunate as going in, we had definitely wanted a larger survey sample size and to interview more individuals, but ultimately it was just not possible with the rapidly changing safety measures. And lastly was thinking about the challenges that GGV could be facing post pandemic. While we were there, tourists were trickling in, but nowhere near the numbers of previous years. We were recognizing just how difficult a comeback is going to be for ecotourism in this region and that once COVID is no longer a pressing issue, uh, the new challenge is just combating the aftershocks that the pandemic has left in its wake for a majority of organizations. Ultimately, this capstone project was definitely a test for our own resiliency and flexibility. Not only did research partners change, but so did projects. Um, our end result is entirely different from the first ideas that we had drafted up during immersion week and even entirely different from the ideas we were throwing around once we were actually in country. And once we landed on a project, suddenly everything was changed once again with the unpredictability of COVID and weekly different mandates that we were having to keep up with. But we were tested as students, research partners and individuals and Overall, the experience was very influential in our development as conservationists. And that is the end. All right, let's shift over. Good job, Lauren. Good job, Summer. Um, very thorough and meticulous, as we know you both are. Um, questions from the room or from people on Zoom. If you're again, if you're on Zoom and have a question, maybe throw the question into the chat and we will um, bring that to Lauren and Summer as they appear. I'll, I'll, I can, I've got a question for you. It's kind of more on the, the academic side on the well-being measures where you have income um, as one of the, uh, the indicators or one of the well-being um, measures in, uh, in the, the, the framework that you use. How did do you, is there a discussion kind of in the kind of authors and researchers behind that? Because income would be a proxy for some of the other measures, right? You need income to buy food. Is um, how, what's my question here? How do you see, in incomes that was kind of this primary outcome that you had in that portion of your survey. Do you have a sense for income for what purpose from the questions that you ask? Not necessarily the questions in your survey, but just in your conversations. Like the lack of income, of course, is bad, but what was that preventing them from presumably purchasing? And is it one of the other things in the, in the category um, on food, education, healthcare? Um, so I could answer this one. Um, so we chose these and income was supposed to reflect economic security. Uh, and so 
yeah, and so it does have influence over the other uh, well-being indicators, but economic security we felt was uh, something separate in its own right um, because it has such far-reaching impacts um, on everything. Um, so yeah, uh, and that was identified by the, the care security model that we uh, looked at in the literature. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that. It's sort of like, what's, you know, how do you feel as far as do you feel like you have enough money to meet your needs sort of thing is, is probably a good broader measure before drilling down to what sounds more specific, like, can you provide enough food to your family? Yeah, it's, it's more of a kind of a curiosity intellectual question on literature than any sort of critique or anything. Yeah, did that, did I answer what you were asking? Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah. I'm curious. So you said one of the more surprising findings was that uh, post COVID or once COVID started, there was the perception that there was less legal activity in the park. And I don't know to what degree that the illegal activity is poaching versus like gathering plants and things like that. But I was curious if there could be any connection to um, COVID as being linked to like a zoonotic disease, you know, that could that potentially spread from people to humans. So like in a sense that there might be an increased personal risk, health risk um, related to harvesting animals um, from the wild. Like did, was there any, did you get any sense for that? Or do you think that that is a viable hypothesis? Yeah, I think definitely that's a really interesting question. And, um... We, we didn't have any conversations where people expressed that they were worried about uh, uh, like uh, getting COVID from wild animals or anything like that. Um, I, I was kind of thinking that maybe people felt that because people were so restricted in movement that that's why illegal activity had gone down. Um, so yeah, and I think that it would be really interesting to compare our perception data to the actual trends from park officials of like ha what happened with legal activity in the park, for sure. I think that would be really uh, key data to look at and like compare. I will say also on the zoonotic disease part of that, because while we were there, we also partook in just some tourism activities with hiking and going to see the gorillas. And so in that sense of interacting with like park officials and other tourists as well, the biggest concern in that area was the zoonotic disease transfer in the opposite direction and the amount of precautions that were being taken to prevent disease transfer from tourists to the animals in the park. So lots of extra hand washing stations, sanitizing um, the group sizes, where the groups were going and also masking up um, with the gorillas, which hadn't previously been done pre-COVID. How gorillas respond to masked humans. <laughs> oh, I have a question. Yeah, uh, sure. What was it like communicating with the people in the Gorilla Garden Guardians Village? It's not, you had some translators to help with your surveys, but did you get to have a lot of conversations with people in the village or were you more limited in that? Uh, we definitely were limited, but there were people, a lot of people were uh, learning English too. And so, and we did have. Uh, more than several people who were fluent in English and could translate. Um, but I think so the predominant language that uh, is taught in schools used to be French, but then in the past decade became English. And so a lot of people are still learning. Um, so yeah, there definitely were, were some issues um, being able to communicate with everybody. And um, most of the time there was somebody around who could translate though. Yeah. I have a question. So you guys touched on how you saw the recommendations from cohort seven weren't being implemented uh, by the Gorilla Guardians. Uh, do you like have an idea of why? Is that just like the top not communicating with the bottom or were, were the recommendations like not viable or something like that? Um, while we were there, we just kind of recognized after talking to the manager that there doesn't really seem to be a like a sis, like a lax system in place for them to like follow up with recommendations that are made or any monitoring capabilities. 
And while we were there, the manager had also made a comment to us about not having access or seeing one of the previous deliverables. We're not sure how long he's been there and if he was there for cohort seven project, but he was there for cohort eight. And so we definitely recognize that there is that gap in if the deliverables that we ourselves are making are actually making it down the pipeline to people on the ground there to actually recognize what the recommendations actually are and what the action steps are. And then in turn with that, if the cohorts are following up or if there is anyone who's just making that contact and being like, hey, how is it going with this um, from what we had pointed out? Uh, yeah, and I think it might be um, just a lack of resources um, because at the end of the day, like, um, yeah, and especially with COVID and everything else that people are experiencing, like people were are just trying to survive and uh, make enough income to meet the needs of their family. And so that does create a lot of challenges. Thank you. Lauren and Summer, we have um, a couple questions in the chat. We'll start with, with Edwin and I'll preface that with um, for, for folks that Edwin is the founder of Gorilla Guardians Village and um, also on the faculty at Penn State University. Um, and so Edwin, we'd love to hear your comments and or questions. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Ryan and, and Summer for the impressive work. I really enjoyed reading through your work. And um, particularly going there at a tough time and navigating all that. So um, great, great, great job. Um, just to loop you in some of the, you know, um, work that you did and the previous cohorts that have done, uh, we have had some challenges, you know, as, as, as you highlighted regarding implementing those best, you know, just to also to the question that was asked earlier, in terms of what, what do you start with? Like right now, for example, we had a meeting last week regarding the closure of the cultural village and the communities are hesitant on that. They don't want that closed. So that means we have to invest in more money because they think that their area of contact with the tourists, once it's gone, then there's no contact with the tourist, for example, then they feel their village is, is going to be lost, you know, with that, it won't be recognized. So there's more attachment to some of these uh, projects and programs beyond the revenues generated. So it's a cost, a lot of cost. We have put in a lot of money as you had indicated. And so to renovate that, even when there are not tourists or tourism dollar coming in. So it's been challenging to look at some of those things, soft and hard infrastructure. Uh, some of those, for example, the websites and renovating all that. So when you have to put that money off, when the need is food and water, for example, becomes so challenging. So we are trying to navigate on a hard, making a choice between all that and also making sure that the communities take the decisions, you know, and then it's not us coming from top to bring these ideas onto them, to look at that, the need. And I think that's, that's what has been successful in terms of mitigating, you know, um, impacts related to legal activities and conservation, rather than you know, focusing on much on how to improve and generate more regarding the programs. But I think the, the research and the work that you have done is quite impressive and it will help us a lot. So really we have started you know, working with the, trying to see some of those areas, uh, particularly to, you know, for example, the domestic tourism and how to improve on that. And also trying to see, because the focus has been on tourism, across the, the continent in terms of community-based uh, tourism initiatives. So we have not had uh, or been able to look beyond tourism to start thinking about you know, enterprises beyond the tourism and how that can be linked to conservation. Um, so we are starting now to look at what can we do? What else can we do? Because COVID, the challenges we have faced has demonstrated enough that we cannot rely on tourism anymore. We have to find out other alternative means of doing that. So. I want to appreciate and thank you for the work that you have done and, and, and also to let you know that we have already started talking about some of these recommendations. Uh, we'll continue to do that. And then uh, as you have also indicated in the email, we look forward to working with you to implement some of these things. And that's, that's, that's the beauty of that is that you go beyond the work that you have done to find out and work with the community, just like the other cohorts that they worked on the water uh, systems and facilities that you saw and see what else can we implement on that. Just one or two things that we can work on from your work to implement to help build the community. So thank you, I appreciate and I appreciate the program and, and continuing the work with the community and the village. Thank you, Thanks, Edmund. Really thank you. Your comments.
We have one other question in the chat from um, Carolyn and Sabrina. So we, I don't know if that's both of you or one of you, but uh, the question is, did you see any economic alternatives emerge from COVID at all? So was there kind of an opportunity in the gloom and doom of COVID that maybe wasn't anticipated or um, that would have been seen without COVID? Um, so I think that, I think that COVID just kind of exacerbated and like further illuminated a lot of these things. I don't know that it created uh, new opportunities, but just kind of, um, yeah, just kind of exacerbated some situations like um, GGV does utilize uh, local markets and like a lot of their agricultural cooperatives will sell produce at local markets and things like that. And um, I think it just kind of highlighted this further need to diversify livelihoods. So like people who are in the cultural village cooperative, um, just having more avenues to join other cooperatives and diversify their livelihoods through agriculture and crafts and other things so that they're not left reeling in the absence of, of one market. Um, but yeah, it's, does that answer your question? I think that, um, and some are definitely add to this, but I, I think that it just kind of highlighted the need for uh, just expanding these other these, into these other markets. Yeah, and I can't speak for um, GGV as an ecotourism company with this, just because they um, the technology implementations of alternative tourism forums is it something that they have been able to implement. But a lot of what we read in the literature review is similar cooperative ran organizations switching to virtual forms of ecotourism, which I'm sure a lot of us have been hearing about throughout the pandemic and re really utilizing like online platform streaming and other alternative online ways to make money without having an actual in-person tourism market present. Yeah, and I feel like ecotourism is still a really significant market that could still be utilized, but just increasing revenue from the cultural village is the main thing because it is such a huge uh, money suck and um, looking at like how to increase um, different things that you can do at the cultural village. And yeah, I, I, I feel like the woofing or um, other like agritourism could be like really great opportunities and that the cultural village definitely could be a great source of income or a greater source of income. 